All right, well, good evening, everyone. Great to see you all here tonight. Before I get started, let me open my Dr. Pepper. I forgot my water bottle tonight, and uh, Pastor Anthony pays me in Dr. Peppers, so i got to take advantage of this while I can. You know, a, a workman's worthy of his wages, as they say, and so there we are. Uh, before uh, we kind of jump in tonight, I do want to make a, a book recommendation I've been meaning to bring this up here for the last couple times we've met, but it always seems to, well, honestly, the problem is I couldn't find it. Uh, I have one or two books at home, and uh, finding one sometimes can be a challenge, especially when it's at the bottom of a pile of like 15. And so, uh, but if you're interested in the subject material, uh, the fact that you're coming back, maybe you are, I don't know, but, um, and you want uh, something to read that's accessible, um, I would recommend this. This is The Baptist Story. Uh, it's from The Baptist Story from English Sect to Global Movement. Uh, Anthony Shute, uh, Nathan Finn, and Michael Haken. Um, written by three, obviously, Baptists, but specifically also written by three Southern Baptists. Though it's not an SBC-only history. It's a history of the Baptist tradition. This is probably the best... Uh, this is probably the best kind of entry-level Baptist history that you uh, can come across. Uh, the Baptist Story by Shute, Finn, and Haken. Anthony Shute teaches uh, church history at California Baptist University, Baptist College uh, there in California. Nathan Finn teaches at North Greenville, which is a Baptist college in South Carolina. So you get both coasts, right? Uh, and then uh, Michael Haken uh, teaches at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, but primarily he resides in Canada, uh, teaches at a couple Canadian Baptist seminaries up there, probably one of the more prolific uh, living uh, Baptist scholars today, but especially uh, British Baptists is kind of where Dr. Haken specializes. But either way, three very, very, very good uh, Baptist scholars, and it's, uh, this book does a great job. It's, it's, even if this seems a little big for you, it's, even this is, it's not as big. There's illustrations on probably... Uh, you know, almost every page, the type set's pretty good size, and so it's really a good, a good solid read. Uh, but anyway, if, if uh, you're looking for a reading recommendation, uh, I would strongly recommend uh, this one. So, it was either this one or the, the 900-page uh, Baptist Theology by James Leo Garrett, so I figured I'd recommend this one, right? But anyway, so uh, if you're looking for some reading material, um, I recommend this one. All right, so Picking up where we kind of, uh, if you remember where we left off last time, and we've had a break over the 4th of July weekend, but we left the British Baptists <clears throat> during their, what we could call a century of decline uh, over the course of the 1700s. Uh, as, as we get into the 1700s, the British Baptists are kind of uh, ascending uh, becoming more numerous, uh, more popular, even in some sense more influential, particularly after the Glorious Revolution, uh, where you get some level of religious liberty in England. There's still kind of some restrictions. There's still primacy, of course, given to the state church, but Baptists are no longer formally, officially, and not just Baptists, but other non non-conforming groups are no longer persecuted. But over the course of the 1700s, it's almost as if as you remove the persecution, other problems begin to set in, in, in both of our brothers of Baptists in Britain. If you remember, the particular Baptists and the general Baptists both have their own theological problems, uh, particular areas of theology where they become kind of unattached to Scripture. Uh, and so uh, because of these two because of their theological trajectories, they both begin to kind of turn in on themselves, uh, begin to cease uh, evangelizing for, for two different reasons, uh, cease uh, witnessing, uh, and essentially cease growing. And so their influence uh, and just their sheer numbers of, of Baptist congregations begins to drop over the course of the 1700s. Now, Baptists don't disappear from Britain, uh, but we do find the level of influence at the beginning of the 1700s diminished by the time we get to the end of the 1700s. God's not done with the Baptists in Britain. There's more to their story um, uh, that we could talk about, uh, particularly amongst the, well, particularly amongst the particular Baptists. 
Uh, you have the birth of the modern missions movement with figures like William Carey, uh, Adoniram Judson, Andrew Fuller. Uh, they, um, uh, they and the, the missions organization that they begin is kind of where we mark the beginning of international missions, kind of like in the more modern sense that we think about it. So kind of sending missionaries to Africa, to India, to Southeast Asia, that begins uh, amongst uh, the particular Baptists, eventually amongst what's left of the General Baptists as well, but, uh, but especially there amongst the uh, particular Baptists. And then, of course, it carries over to America, which we'll talk about probably a little more detail next week. So we're going to leave the British Baptists behind, though. Um, maybe down, but not dead, right? Uh, the bell has not rung yet uh, for the British Baptists. But what we're going to do is we're going to kind of jump across the pond a bit. And uh, tonight, I want to begin talking about the rise of Baptists in America and kind of lay out that particular uh, trajectory, which will kind of connect us eventually, you know, obviously, to the Southern Baptist Convention. So now this may be good news. This may be bad news for you. I don't know. But uh, Pastor Anthony has graciously given me a few extra Sunday nights. So we're going to actually kind of go into August with this. So I'm going to be able to slow down a little bit <laughs> and take a little bit more time. Again, that might be a good thing or a bad thing for you. I'm not really sure. Uh, but uh, so, so what that, one of the things that's going to enable me to do is tonight, especially, I want to, I want to get a little more biographical. And what I mean by that is so far, I haven't really spent a lot of time talking about individual Baptists. We've been talking about Baptists as a movement. We've been talking about churches and confessions and creeds. Uh, but as we start the story of American Baptists, one of the things I want to do is kind of begin uh, getting a little more biographical, talking of a little bit more about kind of influential, uh, or the lives of, of uh, specific influential Baptists or in the case of one person, as, uh, as I'd like to argue, maybe more like Baptist adjacent. Uh, but uh, lives of individual Baptists, and um, maybe we can kind of see things from a different perspective that way. But before I begin, a little background. You know me, I'm, I, I'm a slave to context and to background. So before we talk about Baptists in America, we need to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of the, the colonial experience in North America, and especially the, the religious map, if you will, of British North America, right? Because it's not um, clean. Uh, it's not uniform, right? A lot of times when we think about the colonies, right, when we think about the, the British colonies in North America before the, uh, the War of Independence, a lot often, oftentimes we like to kind of paint with a broad brush and we think that a colonist in the Georgia colony or the Carolina, the Carolinas uh, is the same as a colonist in the Massachusetts colony or Maine or Pennsylvania or these, such, uh, these sorts of things. We just kind of think of colonist, right, as this kind of American colonist, as this broad kind of generic term. One of the things that I really try to emphasize in my American History I uh, class, uh, I'll be teaching that this fall here at HLG, is getting these students to really get an understanding of the diversity within the colonies. These 13 colonies are radically different, radically different, far more different than we really think. And they kind of stay different, honestly, uh, even beyond the War of Independence. Uh, I don't want to chase that rabbit, but you just have to take my word for it, right? Uh, there's a different uh, national makeup for many of them, right? So not, not all of the 13 colonies uh, are primarily English. Uh, most of them are, obviously, but not all of them are. They're all owned by England, but the citizens, the colonists themselves, there's a few colonies that are not primarily English. Not all the same colonists have the same expression of religion, Right, it's one of the things we're going to talk about mostly tonight, these sorts of things. So I want you guys to see tonight and keep your eyes open, particularly tonight, for the diversity amongst the colonies, because that's going to kind of help explain uh, tonight and especially next week as we get into kind of the different, again, just like in Britain, the different roads and the different trajectories Baptists take even here in America. Okay, so. Real quick, again, I'm not huge on dates, but I just want to, to, to overview a few simple things, right? So, of course, the kind of colonial experience, if you will, 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue, right? Uh, Columbus begins 
uh, this trajectory of European nations uh, colonizing uh, North, Central, South America. And one of the things that you'll notice, maybe familiar with Jamestown, right, 1607, Columbus, <coughs> excuse me, there's about a hundred year period, right? So essentially all of the 1500s where England, right, or Great Britain is, is out of the colony game. They're, they, they do a few, they make some small attempts, they do a few small things, but it's, it's really the Spanish and the Portuguese that are almost kind of uncontested, the Dutch a little bit uh, towards the end. But it's really the Spanish and the Portuguese that are kind of uncontested in setting up colonies uh, in, in, uh, in their case in Central and in South America uh, during the 1500s. You don't have a, a permanent English settlement in North America until Jamestown, 1607, right? So the beginning of the 1600s is kind of where, where we're going to start. Now, there had been a, an attempt... Now, this is permanent English settlement. So both of those words are important, permanent and English, right? So this is the first permanent English settlement because you may be familiar with the colony of Roanoke, right? Roanoke uh, was established. Um, Sir Walter Riley attempts to establish the colony of Roanoke. Uh, also in Virginia, or you know, what we think of today as Virginia, uh, in the 1580s. 1590, I think, is when it's done. I think the dates usually are like 85 to 90. But it disappears, uh, essentially. Uh, you can find, they, they found ruins of settlement, but no people. Um, uh, and so, you know, of course, it could be plague. It could be uh, Native American attacks, whatever it may be. So, but regardless, that colony, poof, disappears after about five years. So, again, so that's not continuous. There's also St. Augustine uh, down in Florida, uh, that's, that's actually the oldest continuously settled settlement in North America, but that's Spanish. Um, and so in North America, when it comes to continuously settled in English, Jamestown is kind of where the story begins, okay? So Jamestown, Virginia, 1607, and then it's not necessarily the next one, but the next major one that we often think of is Plymouth, right? So the Pilgrims, right? Plymouth in 1620, and we'll talk about providence here in a minute uh, and why that's important. So, unlike the Spanish colonial experience, this is another thing I try to, try to open the eyeballs of my students, is like colonist doesn't always mean the same thing, right? The way the Spanish colonized and the way the Portuguese colonized are different than the way the English colonized. And the way the English colonized is different than the way the other ones colonized. The way the Dutch colonized is different for the rest of them and so on and so forth, right? They didn't all have the same tactics. They didn't all have the same way of doing it. The English were very sporadic. And the English co colonial adventures were often very, what we would call kind of like private enterprises for the most part. They received permission and grants and charters from the king, from whoever the reigning monarch is at that time, but primarily it was companies, essentially, that would set up these colonies, or kind of groups of, uh, uh, groups of individuals that would kind of pool their money together to buy a charter. It would change a little bit, a little later, but these earliest ones, so it would be like, you know, if Amazon decided to set up a colony on the moon, you know, or if Tesla, you know, Tesla, you know, want, wants to, you know, Elon Musk wants to set up uh, human uh, colonization on Mars, these sorts of things. Like, the, these aren't new ideas, right? This is essentially the way the English, the early English colonies were set up uh, in North America. So, essentially, what, so what, the reason I point that out is, is because different colonies in different parts of North America are colonized by different groups of people for different reasons, okay? So, for instance, Jamestown, okay? Jamestown is essentially established as an economic venture, right? A company in London purchases a charter from the crown to set up a colony in the New World, and they do so primarily 
f to find resources, to find things that the British Empire needs, especially gold, right? They, they, there's all the stories of Spanish gold. They just assume that gold is everywhere, right? You know, spoiler alert, not a lot of gold in Virginia, right? But uh, there's a lot of wood, there's a lot of forest, right? There's stone, there's coal, there's all the raw materials that's needed. Um, there's also uh, very rich farmlands that we'll, you know, we'll kind of get to a little later. But Jamestown is set up um, as a business venture primarily <coughs> by individuals who would, we would think of as kind of loyalists to the crown, right? Very loyal to the crown, very kind of pro-monarchy. Uh, pro think of them like traditional conservative Englishmen, right? And because of that, where's my marker? Because of that, the dominant religion in Jamestown and therefore in the, what will become the Virginia colony as there's more and more settlements established is going to be traditional Church of England Anglican. Prayer book, the king is the head of the church, you know, priests, bishops, the whole nine yards, right? It's got kind of traditional English Church of England-ness. And so because of that, not just Virginia, but most of the southern colonies are dominated by Anglicans. So when we talk about Virginia, uh, the Carolina colonies, uh, they start off as one colony but eventually split into north and south. Uh, the Georgia colony, they're primarily dominated by traditional Anglicans. And again, that doesn't really change over time. This is one of the reasons why, if you're not familiar with this, you will be now, uh, there were more loyalists. So during the War of Independence, there were more loyalists, so colonists who were pro-Britain, who didn't want to break away from, uh, from the crown. There were more loyalists in the South so in the Virginia colony and the Carolinas and Georgia than in anywhere else, especially like places somewhere like New England. So the further south you went, generally, the more kind of traditional conservative English culturally and religiously it would be. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. Now Plymouth, the Pilgrims, is a whole nother ball game, right? So what do we know about the, pil the Pilgrims? Why did they leave England for what? For religious freedom, for, for them. <laughs> and we'll get to that little part in the story, right? But yes, so Plymouth is founded by radical Puritans. What we, what we from last week, what we would call, what eventually we would call separatists. Remember we were talking about British Baptists? We had those two kind of categories for Puritans usually wanted to stay uh, within the Church of England and reform it, and then you had separatists that wanted to break out. Those, those two categories stay pretty clear in the 1500s and into the early 1600s, but by the time you get to the mid-1600s, they kind of start merging together, and a lot of Puritans become radical. Like, and, so, and that's the case of the pilgrims. The pilgrims wanted to start a new church, essentially, Right? And they wanted a new colony, a new uh, commonwealth, in order to, uh, well, really, honestly, in some sense, as an extension of that church. Right? So, yes, they wanted religious freedom, but they also wanted political freedom to be able to establish a, a what at first is a town, but really a whole colony where their vision of religious order of ecclesial, you know, church order is uh, accomplished. So this is how we get into trouble with Baptists a little later. So Plymouth, so, in, so again, if you're not familiar, Plymouth is Massachusetts, right? So the Massachusetts colony. Plymouth, the Massachusetts colony, is dominated by Puritans, and, and moving forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be calling them Congregationalists, because that's, that's, Historically, that's eventually what, when they come to America, eventually what we start calling them is congregationalists. And they're called congregationalists because these Puritan congregations do see 
Um, this is one of the reasons why particular Baptists often came out of these Puritan congregationalist uh, groups is that they did have a vision of local independent churches. So in that sense, they were like Baptists, but they weren't like Baptists in that they still believed in infant baptism and they still believed in kind of an aggressive kind of covenant theology and these sorts of things, right? So <clears throat> this is why New England... So Massachusetts Colony, New Hampshire, Maine, Jersey, not New York. Uh, New York's a different ballgame because uh, they were originally a Dutch colony. But the, the kind of the New England states that we think about, the New England colonies are dominated by Congregationalists, by these Puritans. Okay? Everybody tracking with me so far? Okay, perfect. Now, then the rest, I just kind of stick under other right? Because they, they don't have the level of kind of political dominance that we see, sorry, that we see in other areas. So you do get populations, especially in the mid, so it's, it's interesting how these kind of fit in the three big zones of American colonies. So if you're not familiar, there's, there's the American colonies kind of are, are, can, can be kind of lumped together in three families, if you will. There's the New England colonies, there's the southern colonies, and in the middle, there's the, wait for it, the middle colonies. Uh, and so the middle colonies are like Pennsylvania, Delaware, you know, the, the, these, these kinds of colonies, right? So the northern colonies, the New England colonies are dominated by the Puritan Congregationalists. The southern colonies are dominated by traditional Anglicans. The middle colonies is kind of like all of the above, Right? Uh, because you get a lot, this is where we also get a lot of settlers that are not English. So you get a lot of German settlers, you get a lot of Dutch settlers, even some French Protestant settlers. And so uh, it's kind of a little bit more of a mixed bag. You get kind of Dutch Reformed, you get some Scottish Presbyterians. Presbyterianism kind of comes from Scotland. Um, that's the Scottish Reformation is kind of where Presbyterianism comes from. Uh, Lutherans, of course. Uh, with the Germans uh, come Lutheranism. So the middle colonies are, are a lot more diverse, as we would think about it, religiously diverse. North, you have Congregationalists. South, you have Anglicans. Okay? Any questions at this point? Okay. So let's actually start talking about some Baptists. All right? So when we talk about the Baptist story, we're going to begin really more so with Plymouth than with Jamestown. So Baptists in America, the story of Baptists in America begins in New England, okay? Um, and we're going to start by talking about, again, like I said, I, I want this to be a little more biographical, <clears throat> but we're going to start by talking about two particular individuals. First is Roger Williams, and the second is John Clark. So I'm going to kind of start telling their stories, especially Roger Williams' stories, and then we'll see kind of how Baptists kind of begin. Because I can go ahead and tell you, let me skip a little bit to the end of the story, what doesn't happen, right? So what doesn't happen nearly as much as a lot of people think is that a bunch of general or particular Baptist congregations in England hop on a boat and come across to the Americas like... Um, uh, well, like the Puritans, for instance, or the Anglicans, for that matter. That happens some, like they're, you know, crossing the English Channel to go to Amsterdam is a little different than crossing the Atlantic Ocean. It happens some, but it doesn't happen that much. So one of the, one of the things a lot of people don't realize is that even though we are, we are certainly theologically connected, we'll see those connections as we move forward, Baptists in America are certainly theologically, culturally connected to British Baptists. A lot of American, the American Baptist experience is kind of homegrown, for lack of a better expression. Okay? But we're going to start with Roger Williams. So Roger Williams, you may um, be familiar with the name. Uh, Roger Williams is probably most famously known as the founder of the Rhode Island Colony. <clears throat> He's actually one of the founders, but that's neither here nor there. But 
Roger Williams, one of the founders of the Rhode Island colony, uh, his dates there, 1603 to 1680. So Roger Williams is, I think the technical definition for it is, he, is an oddball. Um, he, he, never, he never quite is able to kind of theologically stay in one bucket for a long period of time. In this way, and it's, this is one of history's ironies, uh, British Baptists, in some sense, kind of as we talked about, if you remember, begins with John Smythe, who was Baptist for like three months. Roger Williams kind of has the same story. Yeah, he starts off in England, right? Uh, he's a Cambridge graduate. A lot, of these, uh, a lot of these Puritans, a lot of Puritans come out of Cambridge because it was, you know, it's hard to think of Cambridge as like a radical school, but compared to Oxford, it was like the radical school. Right? And so a lot of these separatists, a lot of these radical Puritans, they come out of Cambridge. So Roger Williams was a graduate of Cambridge. Uh, he becomes a Puritan minister in the Church of England. So he starts off as a, as a pastor in the Church of England, but he's definitely kind of of, the, of the, the Puritan persuasion that wants to stay in the Church of England, but reform it from the inside. But by the time we get to about 1630, he's kind of a convinced separatist. So he, he, he wants to separate from the Church of England. He believes that England, uh, the Church of England is, has apostatized, it's not a true church, and that true Christians, in his mind, uh, need to set up new churches, need to set up their own new church. About this time, he decides to leave England uh, for the new world, right? So about 1630, 1631. And when I say he decides, what I really mean is he was driven out. Um, because this is kind of during the height of the persecutions of a guy named Archbishop Laud. Now, he sounds scary, and that's because he is. right? Archbishop Laud was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury for Charles I. If you remember, Charles I is the guy that had his head cut off uh, before the English Civil War. Archbishop Laud, so if, I, you know, uh, he's like the he's like the the best analogy. And it's maybe lost, I know, but the best analogy I get is Laud is kind of like the Darth Vader uh, uh, of the of of the of the uh, the the Puritan and the nonconformist story. He he saw it as his mission to keep the Church of England um, traditional and high church, and to basically root out any dissent, be that Puritan dissent or radical separatist descent. So Laud is hunting down not just separatists and radical Puritans, but he's hunting down Baptists as well. So in the midst of this persecution, Roger Williams leaves Britain. He escapes, really. He escapes Britain and makes his way to uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, he goes to Massachusetts because, again, this is, this is, they're, they're radical Puritans, right? They're in, it, this is one of the things I love about this story, is because it's, it's basically a chain of radicals, right? So the, the Puritans were radicals. They did not want to conform to the Church of England. Not only did they not want to conform, they wanted to completely distance themselves and separate from the Church of England. So they established the Massachusetts colony, right, to kind of flesh out their vision, to flesh out their dream of church and state. Then a guy like Roger Williams shows up, and Roger Williams is a radical, but he's too radical for even the radical Puritans, because eventually, Roger Williams, by the time uh, we get uh, kind of to the middle of the 1630s, Roger Williams is expelled by the Puritan leaders of the, of the Massachusetts colony because he believed in crazy things, like you shouldn't baptize babies, odd idea, right? And he believed that the state cannot enforce or should not be able to enforce the theological beliefs of its citizens. In other words, at this time, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it's legally mandated. There's a law that you have to go to church, that you have to tithe. And not just any church, but, but the Purit uh, Puritan church, their particular, the Congregationalist Church, right? And so 
in other words, whereas here, when, it, you know, here at Emmanuel, if you step out, you know, if, if you have unrepentant sin or if you step outside of certain theological parameters, the church will discipline you, right, and remove you from the congregation. In the Massachusetts Bay, that same thing would happen, but then the state would come and put you in jail. <laughs> or they would remove you from the colony, right? So this is the issue that Roger Williams runs into. Roger Williams um, uh, is essentially booted out by the, the leaders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But fortunately for Williams, he has friends in high places. And by high places, really what I mean is Cromwell, right? So by, by now, we, you know, Charles I has lost his head, and we're in the midst of the English Civil War. And so Williams <clears throat> is able to convince the Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell, to grant a charter, uh, to grant permission uh, for a new colony to be established. And it's in William's mind, along with his friend, John Clark, um, who John Clark is more, whereas Roger was like, Roger Williams was more of the theological radical, radical the theological maverick. John Clark was too, but John Clark was also kind of the politician, the legal mind, the legal expert, these kinds of things. And so they come together, essentially. They get permission from Cromwell's government, uh, and they uh, set up initially what's called Providence Plantation in 1636. So Providence Plantation, this is actually what they do before they get official permission. They're kind of, they, they kind of set this up off the grid. So you know the stories of like, the guys that, you know, uh, set up a compound out in the middle of nowhere in Idaho and they declare themselves like an independent country and these kinds of things, it's a little bit like that. Maybe a bad analogy, but that's the closest thing I can think of. They basically go outside of the Massachusetts colony in kind of the no man's land um, um, of technically it's kind of the Massachusetts colony, but nobody lives there and they kind of set up their own place. But eventually... Uh, they're able to get permission, and they, and they formally form the Rhode Island colony. And the Rhode Island colony has what we would more readily recognize as an kind of almost like an absolute form of religious liberty. In other words, there's no state church. So Rhode Island's the first of the colonies to not have a state-sponsored, state-ordered church. Um, and there's um, essentially religious freedom to operate within Rhode Island Colony. So, with that, Williams and Clark, they found the Rhode Island Colony, they start the city or the, the township of Providence, so Providence, Rhode Island, right? Providence, they start that city uh, in 1638. Clark and Williams co-found uh, Providence, but along with that, they begin uh, the first uh, Baptist church. Yes, it was called that. Uh, the first Baptist church. I just threw it there. They start the first Baptist church of America. And this is in Providence, Rhode Island, 1638. You can go and see it today. Not the original building, obviously, but a very old building uh, there in Providence in downtown. It's really beautiful. Um, if you ever get a chance, I know Providence, Rhode Island is a big vacation destination for a lot of people. Uh, but you can see it, it's there. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty looking church. But this is uh, the first Baptist, distinctly Baptist congregation in America, in North America, well, really any of the Americas, but, you know, we're looking particularly at North America. Now, Williams, at this point, has, a, especially Clark, and this is kind of where we're, we're going to shift, you know, we're, we're still going to talk about Williams a little bit more, but th this, is, this is the short, the two or three year period where Williams and Clark kind of line up theologically and all of the theological markers that we think of when it comes to Baptists, right? So regenerate church membership, believer's baptism, right? 
um, uh, separate, you know, religious liberty, separation of church and state, these sorts of things, uh, liberty of conscience. All of these items begin kind of line up for this few year period, and so uh, Clark and Williams are able to operate at least for a few years within the same congregation. So I do want to talk about uh, one work of Williams uh, for just a minute. Williams, probably his most famous written work, uh, is a, a pamphlet he wrote called The Bloody Tenant of Persecution. Bloody Tenant of Persecution. He writes this in 1644. And essentially, it's a, a, an, an argument against the state enforcement of religion in the Massachusetts uh, colony. Okay? So, you know, he's in Rhode Island by this point, but there's a popular Boston minister named John Cotton, and John Cotton writes this kind of famous uh, um, editorial kind of theological uh, book or pamphlet talking about, okay, well, these are all the reasons why the state should enforce religion. And by state, he means the Massachusetts colony. So Williams, in 1644, he writes the bloody tenant of persecution essentially as a response to John Cotton. And in it, I'm not going to go through it point by point, but basically what Williams is arguing is that Christianity requires the existence of a separate civil authority which can't infringe on the liberty of conscience. In other words, he sees the the church and the state's role as being distinct. Now, despite what some radical uh, secularists and separatists might say, Williams does not have a vision of a kind of religiously neutral state. It's actually impossible. Every state has a religion kind of operating under it. It just depends on whether they acknowledge it or not, right? Our laws have a moral undergirding no matter what, you know. So anyway, that's a whole other discussion. The point I'm getting at here is that what Williams is insisting is that, think of it like the Ten Commandments, right? And Williams actually uses this as an illustration, as an argument. So does Clark as well in his own works. Williams and Clark both insist that the state, while it can enforce the second table of the Ten Commandments, so second table, don't steal, don't commit adultery, things that are essentially laws geared towards human-to-human interactions, the things necessary for a civil society, right? Does that make sense? Williams and Clark will say, and, and, and all Baptists, and, and again, this is not just American Baptists, British Baptists are saying the same thing, if you remember. But British Baptists, American Baptists, Baptists in general, we're all saying that the state essentially needs to stick to the second table of the law. The state cannot enforce the first table, right? The God that you worship, how you worship him, those commandments, right? And that's essentially what the Puritans in the Massachusetts Bay and really any state that has a state church is attempting to do is to prescribe the way in which the first uh, table is to be um, enforced, right? Right? So in other words, the, the Massachusetts colony and guys like John Cotton were wanting the state to in, enforce, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And Williams and Clark are, and all Baptists are saying, no, 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 no. The state, yes, they can enforce the second table and then all the derivatives thereof, but the state can't enforce the first table. They cannot violate conscience. And it's the bloody tenant in 1644 that provides influence and provides a kind of theological grounding for future documents of religious liberty in American history. So you see aspects of William's argument in the bloody tenet pop up in the writings of John Locke, in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, and especially in the writings of Thomas Jefferson on religious liberty. Thomas Jefferson's actually kind of, uh, you could you could kind of, cite him for plagiarism in a, in a few places because uh, he pulls so generously uh, from, from Roger Williams uh, and John, well, from, mostly from, from Roger Williams and, and his work uh, on Bloody Tenet, okay? And so there's a lot more to Bloody Tenet than that. There's a whole theological argument. He basically makes, you know, 
without getting too deeply into it, essentially the, the whole theological mechanism for a state church is basically saying that modern nations like England or like the Plymouth Colony, they can be like Israel. And they not just can be, but should be like Israel. So in the same way that Israel has covenanted, as a, Israel as a nation covenanted with God, uh, the Plymouth Colony or the Massachusetts Bay Colony can covenant with God. In the same way that Israel uh, in the Old Testament was required to enforce uh, religious uniformity within Israel, tear down the Asherah poles, take out the temples to Moloch and these sorts of things. In the exact same way, modern nations should do the same thing. That's essentially, in a very broad brush strokes, the kind of state church argument, right? In enforcing both tables of the law. And Williams and Clark make a New Testament emphasis argument, saying that no, that we, we don't see that in the New Testament. We don't see that as something that the church, the New Testament church, under the new covenant is supposed to do. Yes, um, again, that will be the goal one day. There will be no other worship one day, but Jesus does that. Jesus enforces that. Jesus enforces the first table of the law in the great judgment. Modern states can't do it. Why? Last time I checked, there's sinners there. So they do it imperfectly, which is why a bunch of Baptists died at various points, as well as a lot of other people. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, uh, I want to kind of wrap up there with Roger Williams. We'll talk about uh, John Clark and the whipping of Obadiah Holmes uh, next week. It's a really fascinating story where you can kind of see the, the rubber meeting the road uh, here of the, the, the persecution that Baptists are coming under, particularly in New England, right? The middle colonies aren't quite set up yet. You don't have the, like, Pennsylvania there just yet, though it's kind of coming online. Uh, Baptists are primarily, these early Baptists are concentrated in New England at first. Eventually, they make their way down to the south uh, to Charleston, uh, ironically, when a church from Maine decides to move all together down to Charleston, South Carolina. I don't blame them. I've been to Maine. It's cold. Um, but uh, we'll get to that later. What I, but what I want to end with, with Williams, is this. Williams uh, is often given credit as the first Baptist in America. So there is a sense in which I think that you could say that, uh, in that he helps found the First Baptist Church of America. He certainly does have Baptist sensibilities and, and a, a general sort of Baptist theology for a year or two. Um, however, shortly after the First Baptist Church of America is founded, uh, Williams does what Williams does, and he wanders off. Uh, and he wanders off not just geographically, but also theologically as well. And he eventually, just within a year or two after this, he wanders south to some of the early, um, the early Dutch colonies um, in uh, what eventually will become Pennsylvania uh, and New Jersey, uh, joins several Quaker congregations who Quakers are basically like American versions of Anabaptists. So again, the parallels between John Smythe and Roger Williams are kind of shocking. Um, you know, both of them kind of are, are um, break a lot of ice for early Baptists. Both of them create the kind of environments in which the earliest Baptists are able to kind of grow up, but they themselves, it's kind of iffy if you really even can count them as, I mean, there certainly aren't Baptists lifelong, and their actual contribution to Baptist life and thought is kind of really more of a pinpoint than a lifetime of influence. It's really just in the same way that I would I feel a lot more comfortable saying like Thomas Helwes in England is kind of the first Baptist and the first English Baptist. I'm a lot more comfortable giving that title to John Clark uh, as the first uh, Baptist in America. But having said all that, just know a lot of people, most people probably, uh, give it to Williams just because... He's a lot more famous than people have heard of him. So there's that. Uh, all right, so I'm going to end there. We'll, we'll pick up with John Clark um, uh, next week. Uh, so any questions at this point?
thoughts, comments? Okay, excellent. I didn't go 10 minutes over. So for 6.03, this is actually early for me. So, all right. Well, guys, thank you so much for your attention uh, tonight. I really appreciate you all in that. And uh, we'll see. I think Dr. Maps is going to talk to us next week is the plan right now uh, to talk about the cooperative program. So he's going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, Well, I say a little bit, 400 years a bit. Uh, uh, Well, 300 and some change uh, a bit to talk about the modern cooperative program. And then I'll be back uh, to pick back up with American Baptist. And then we'll talk about the SBC uh, in August. So, Pastor Anthony, anything as we wrap up? Okay, well, let me pray for you all. Lord God, thank you so much for this Lord's Day. Thank you for uh, the story uh, of Baptists, and particularly the Baptists in America. Uh, May we learn from their virtues and learn from their folly. Uh, And Lord God, thank you for the grace uh, of those uh, that have come before us. In your name we pray, amen.